We're uh, here to announce uh, INET related and CG Center for International Governance Innovation uh, is our teammate, as you have been since uh, the inception of INET, uh, for a committee on global economic transformation. The uh, committee will focus on a number of problems that we don't think the world left to its own devices are addressing and which uh, contain great human import. Obviously, uh, issues related to climate, issues related to the difficulty of global governance, uh, particularly in a global financial system where technology and m money, wealth are mobile and humans are not. The increasing problems associated with migration, the difficulties in an emerging country in dealing with technology and development because the old model, which you might say past is no longer prologue. In the old days, little infant industry protection, manufacturing could help you bootstrap up. Today in the era of global supply chains, automation and smart machines, the promise of that development strategy is no longer as strong, but, the, but that does not, uh, how do you say, leave us without needing to develop strategies and, and so this group will work on that and also the relationship between technology and disruption, which is a broad-based challenge for many of the advanced as well as developing countries. Uh, the commission will be co-chaired by Nobel laureates Michael Spence, who could not be here today, and Joseph Stiglitz, and, uh, and the chairman of the board, Adair Turner, and Rohit and Medora are here with Joe and myself today. So, Joe? Well, uh, uh, Rob defined, uh, uh, in a way, some of the themes that we're going to be talking about. Um, I think one way to think about, I think there's a broad sense uh, that the standard market economy as we know it in the United States and Europe uh, has not been working well for most citizens or for at least a very significant fraction. And uh, the failure of it to work has clearly had political consequences in the United States and with the possibility in other countries. So uh, the recognition that that model is not working uh, is itself a reason for um, uh, uh, the formation of commission. Um, the uh, take the issue, one of the issues that's been on the agenda, the issue of globalization, uh, I, I think that the way globalization was managed in the past, sometimes called the neoliberal model or whatever, uh, 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 did not work for large fractions of the citizens. But the Trump protectionist and the protectionist of, and nativist policies are going to be equally bad for the same groups of people. So there needs to be a third way. And uh, that's just one example of a whole cluster of problems. Uh, Adair has been very involved in the issues of climate change, as I have. Uh, there's absolutely no doubt that we are going to have to change the way our economies function if we are going to uh, survive, so, uh, that, that we, there will have to be, at some point the world, the, the world will wake up to this, but there will be major changes. Uh, I think it can be good for the economy, uh, but the Commission will explore how do we integrate good climate policy with good economic policy, and, and how do we go, uh, go forward. Um, Changes in technology uh, are in causing a lot of anxiety around the world that uh, the loss of jobs that's been associated with globalization uh, may be uh, uh, small compared to the loss of jobs that may be a result of robotization and AI. And clearly there's a lot of anxiety and the question is, is that justified? And if it is justified, uh, how do we as societies respond to that? 
the um, model that was most successful for development uh, in uh, East Asia, which was the manufacturing-led, export-led model, is not going to be working for Africa. And that's where the, the, the one place in the world that remain most people in poverty and most of the population growth over the next 50 years will be in Africa. In fact, more than 100% of the growth in employment of a labor force will be in Africa. So what are they going to do if the manufacturing-led uh, export model uh, isn't working? Let me explain. The reason it's not going to work is that globally, employment in manufacturing is diminishing. Yeah. And I think it's part of the growth, success of the growth of productivity in manufacturing. And uh, that uh, means that there will be, have to be a different model for growth, uh, for development in Africa. And so, you know, there, there are, uh, this is an issue that's begun to be discussed. But if that problem isn't solved, the problems of migration, which have, uh, Europe has already been com confronted with, uh, will become worse. And uh, um, there, uh, those, you know, no, I, mean, I know there's been a you know very large migration between Latin America and the United States. But if you look at the gap between Africa and, and Europe, and you look at the gaps in income and the growth in population, the pressure on Europe will be even far greater. And so uh, I think there's an imperative to to uh, increase incomes in, uh, in Africa. And uh, just to uh, add one more aspect, uh, or, or two more aspects to this, uh, our understanding of the economic model has changed. Um, it's changed in a couple of ways. One, the 2008 crisis showed that financially led economic model, which was the, sort of the, the model that predominated before 2008, didn't work very well. It didn't produce high growth and it didn't produce stable growth. But it is still the predominant model. And so uh, we need to understand why it didn't work better than we do and what to do about it. Now, it's obviously much more of an Anglo-American problem than it is in some other countries, but uh, uh, America is a big part of the economy. The UK has been following that model, uh, or at least uh, England has been following that model, and um, so uh, this represents uh, uh, another example. Um, there's some really, in fi final example, a, a really striking uh, re-examination in the United States about not only the growth of inequality but uh, the change in factor shares. So the labor share is down, particularly if you exclude the top 1% of labor that's associated with finance and CEOs and not really labor in the way we usually think about it. But the striking thing is the share of capital is also down. What does it mean the share of capital and the share of labor is down? Well, share of ranks, monopoly ranks, all other sources of ranks are up. And that's a very different model of the economy than has been taught in basic economics for uh, a very long time. And um, what are the sources of ranks and how do we rethink how an economy with that is so rent-driven and which is so far from the competitive model that Adam Smith talked about, um, although he was very aware of, of the presence of imperfections of competition, um, but it's become the, it was the dominant paradigm probably for now for 100 years, uh, that uh, it's clear that there's going to have to be a rethinking not only of an, under, of, of an understanding of how our economic system uh, functions. Um, all of these issues are actually interrelated. So I've listed them as separate issues, but they're actually interrelated, and the answers, the policy responses are relate, uh, going to be interrelated. 
And those will include a rethinking of the role of the state versus uh, the market and civil society, um, rethinking some of the old models and trying to develop new models. So obviously in, in the short span of time of uh, the commission, we're not going to be able to uh, uh, develop all new theory. But the good news is that over the last uh, 10 years, 15 years, large elements of an alternative model have been constructed. And so what we hope to do is to try to pull together these various strands and to create, you might say, a narrative or an understanding, and understanding what was wrong with the other narratives and why, why a lot of the conventional wisdom isn't wisdom anymore, and uh, why we really need to, to rethink uh, a lot of uh, the paradigm and uh, uh, standard paradigm and a lot of the policy answers that, that have been accepted in not everywhere, but in large parts of the world. Um, before we head to Q&A, just a quick reminder to the journalists and others in the room that um, the information is under embargo until midnight tonight. I'm sorry to, um, to re announce. I know everyone wants to tweet, and there are some great things being said here, but we just have to hold back on social media and, and any other media um, until midnight tonight. So thank you very much. Yeah, yeah just uh, as, as by way of process, the commission members are chosen in large part for geographic diversity from all around the world, people with various different expertise, so we're spanning the issue space. Gender and ethnic racial diversity is also a very important consideration. Uh, we'll be meeting periodically as a group. We'll have subcommittee meetings uh, at various different places on these, each, each of these thematic posts. But I, uh, I would imagine we'll be meeting in China, possibly in India, hopefully in Africa, and uh, probably in, in Canada or Latin America uh, before this is all done. We would imagine 18 months to two years from now, though it's not going to be, how would I say, embargoed until the end. I would imagine we'll be quite heavily engaged and, and there will be public uh, discussion of preliminary recommendations and amplification through a website and through uh, open some open meetings with some of the research, some of which has already been created and just needs to be raised in visibility and some of which will be commissioned freshly. Uh, we have a, a fifth commissioner who's here with us today, Peter Bofinger from Germany, uh, and uh, he will not be able to participate in the Q&A today because uh, he is one of the wise men of Germany and they're preparing their report right now and uh, he is embargoed. Uh, so you'll have to come back in two weeks to learn about Germany. But uh, let's uh, actually just quickly, Rohinton, thoughts you have on intellectual property rights, thoughts on the purpose of, of this whole endeavor. Uh, Rob, colleagues, thank you. Um, we, we, we've. We've, we've, we've been given sort of two examples, climate change and the rise of next generation technologies, where it's clear that we as a global community face a choice of where we want to go. And while history can be a guide, we also know that solutions that worked in the past don't necessarily offer themselves this time because the circumstances have changed and the nature of these, uh, of these beasts is so much different. You mentioned IP. Um, one point already made but worth thinking about is that if you have uh, two-thirds of humanity not able to grow its incomes through roots that we know, what exactly will they do? This is the kind of tricky question where we can't go back to something that no longer exists. We heard about how rents take up so much more um, of the proportion of, of space, of economic space. If increasingly we're going to see that um, new technologies are driven by proprietary processes, then rents from IP are likely what's dominating the statistic that Joe gave us, in which case we have to ask ourselves, where's the next generation of innovation going to happen? Can it be made truly global? And can we all benefit from it so that we're going to have to rethink public finance, public policy, and innovation system strategies? The third and final thought I have on this is that 
data has now been called the new oil, and we might want to think about that not just as an economic proposition, but as a civic proposition. That who owns data? How do we collect it? How do we turn it into metadata? And to what uses is it put? These are all questions that communities, countries, and eventually global governance systems are going to have to think through. And that's the kind of challenge we, we intend to take on uh, at the Commission, which also brings up uh, just one quick point. Do we have the institutions currently, nationally and globally, that we require for the next 50 or 100 years of progress? Well, one of the pleasures for me in being at the center of coordination of this is to work with people like Joe Stiglitz and Adair Turner. And what I'm really alluding to is if you were using the metaphor of American baseball, they can play almost all nine positions in every game. Adair Turner, who had been a senior fellow at INET, has written a book, Between Debt and the Devil, about a very innovative book on the financial system. He's chaired major committees on climate and climate-related issues. He's got a lot of ideas on how positional goods relate to inequality. Uh, I don't think, I, I'm, we, I got a nice lesson on demographics the last two times we've had a chat. <laughs> There's just so many dimensions, like Joe Stiglitz, that Adair uh, can, is masterful and, uh, and helps us see a vision and see the interlinkages between one issue area and another. But uh, Adair, the Chairman of the Board of INET, what are your thoughts? Uh, well, I think I can see some of the interlinkages between the issues. There are some to which I don't know what the answer is, and I think on this commission we should think about it. It strikes me that the thing that we're very clear of in the developed world is this issue of slow growth, rising inequality, and the broad issues of secular stagnation that we talked about in a panel uh, earlier today. And I, I set out there a, a belief uh, that there were some fundamental uh, drivers of, of that. Other parts of the world are doing considerably better. China is doing much better. But there are also other parts of the world which are not doing so well. There are lots and lots of countries out there which have got to middle income level and then find it incredibly difficult uh, to break through uh, to higher income uh, levels. People, some people then come along and say, OK, but the solution to this is just incredibly rapid productivity growth driven by the application of technology. And that's the answer. There doesn't need to be a changed balance between the state and uh, the market. There doesn't need to be uh, interventions uh, to uh, ensure greater product uh, uh, equality. Uh, there don't need to be government uh, interventions to deal with climate change. It'll all be cured by technological progress, the private sector, and productivity. And I think the fundamental problem that we're facing is that that's not true. These problems are not simply going to get cured automatically. And indeed, some of them, bizarrely, but paradoxically, I think are going to get more challenging. Uh, I personally uh, believe, and I'll be uh, talking further uh, this evening about this, that we are facing extraordinary technological capabilities, the ability to automate more and more functions, the ability to uh, innovate uh, new products. But I think, in many ways, these may make the challenges for some developed countries and some developing countries more challenging than they are at the moment. Uh, I think that as we apply these technologies in the developed markets, we may see that the tendencies to inequality which we are struggling with get further intensified by the impact of technology. And I think if you think about the application of technology in a country like India, where I have just come back from, it, I think, is going to make it much more difficult to create jobs fast enough. The Indian economy is now growing quite fast. It's growing at about 7% per annum. But at the moment, it is creating no new jet net jobs, although it has a working population growing at about 10 million a year. And if that's a problem for India, as Joe has already accepted, uh, suggested, it's an even bigger problem uh, for some of the countries of uh, Africa. I think we live in a world in which it's highly likely that in 2050, all the manufactured goods that the world need will be produced by maybe 5% of the global workforce. I wouldn't guess it would be higher than that. And at one level, it's fantastic. We've created an environment uh, in which uh, you know, machines can do stuff for us. 
Uh, but it's also a problem about where people get income, where people get growth. So I think this commission is an opportunity for us to step back and to think about what is the current situation of different countries around the world and how are they going to, is, are those problems of those different countries going to be made easier or more difficult uh, by technology and what is the relationship between these countries and within that the issue of climate change I think is also uh, an important one. Again, I am very confident that we are creating new technologies which will enable us to deal with climate change, certainly in relation to renewable power, electricity, uh, the cost reductions that we are seeing in uh, a wind energy, solar energy, uh, a, uh, a batteries are really quite remarkable. And actually, interestingly, reflect a remarkably effective combination of the intervention of the state and the role of the private sector. What has happened in those technologies is that initial deliberate subsidies put in place, often against the advice of extreme free marketeers, have unleashed developments that have then taken those technologies down a learning curve process to the point where they will no longer need subsidies. That's very optimistic. But there are also some wider challenges on this climate change debate. I think issues to do with the design of cities, issues to do with the cost of capital which is required to unleash these technologies across the world, which I don't think we can be confident will just be solved, certainly not by a free market, or even by a free market with simply one intervention, which is a carbon price. I happen to think a carbon price is very important, but I think it is an oversimplistic approach to the challenges of climate change, uh, though an oversimplistic approach to which many people who come from the neoliberal stance get attracted, which is to say, well, if there's an externality, boom, you have a carbon price and then you all go home uh, and the market works perfectly. I think there are important and difficult issues there as well. So this commission, I think, is an opportunity. And it is, this is an ambitious intellectual project. And we're going to have to try hard to make sure we can work out how all the bits uh, fit together. But there are a set of challenges going on across the world to which technology and private sector innovation is part of the solution, but is not a sufficient solution without careful thinking about what the public policy domain is at national and at global level. And that's the agenda we need to address. Very good. People have questions uh, they'd like to address to anyone else? <laughs> Sir? Can you stand up and state your outline in your name? Um, I'm Jorge Valero. I work for El Economist and uh, a news media called Your Active. And my question is... Uh, Could go wrong. Could go El Economist and Your Active. OK, fine. Yes. Uh, you raised the issue of globalization. And looking at globalization, I mean, we see that the political and business elite, so to say, needed 20 years, <coughs> if not more, to realize that the globalization failed or at least didn't deliver on its promise of bringing more prosperity. And only now, I mean, last, uh, during the last uh, economic forum in Davos, there was some sort of mea culpa on, on this. So what needs to happen for about an other 20 years uh, uh, of, I mean, from the technological challenge? I mean, that uh, the, the, the elite, uh, the, the political class, will realize that we need to act now and in order to address the challenges and inequalities that might bring, uh, might come with the, with the technological disruption. So, uh, I mean, you're absolutely right. It, it, uh, it takes a long time sometimes for ideas to permeate. I, I, as you know, I wrote a book called Globalization and Discontents uh, almost 20 years ago and, and uh, said it wasn't working very well. And uh, I think the election of 2016 in the United States and similar elections elsewhere have really brought home the issue that the market economy is not working the way it's described as everybody benefiting, large fractions of the population have not been benefiting, and they're angry, and that's had a political consequence. So I think that's both uh, one of the reasons for optimism that the results of the report will be paid attention to, and one of the reasons why it's important for a commission like this to be formed, because uh, it's clear that uh, we have not uh, 
addressed, we did not address the challenges posed by globalization as they were occurring. And uh, robotization and AI will be presenting equal challenges. And uh, if we don't do that, I mean, I, I think really the, 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 the future of the market economy will be, really be put to question uh, in our democracies. So, um, or our democracies will be put into question. So I think the impetus for learning the lesson of our failures in globalization are really very strong. And in a way, it makes me hopeful that maybe somebody will pay attention to the results of the commission. <laughs> <laughs> Another question? Yes. Hi, I'm Thea Goodman of Bloomberg News. It's kind of building on that question. It hasn't been a great couple of years for experts, particularly in their relationship with politicians in the political debate. How do you make sure that your view gets through to politicians and the public and can have an impact on policy making? I would start by saying that uh, you would hope people like First Minister Sturgeon are chosen by the people of a country. And, and then there's not as much need for the commission. Uh, <laughs> I think that this challenge is formidable. And yet, most people that I talk to in government all around the world when I travel around are quite anxious right now. If you say to me, why is this situation present itself? Why, why do we have to create a commission right now? It's because people are quite fearful that the dysfunction of economies, particularly with regard to what I'll call social sustainability, but the ominous prospect of migration and climate change and their interaction, frightens people. Voters act like they are despairing, and probably with good reason. The effectiveness of government, where the domain of the sovereign is much smaller than the scope of the market, it's not even a matter of intent. It's a question of whether you can achieve that. But the biggest danger right now is whether this dysfunctional economics produces not the wisdom of crowds in a democratic governments, but puts, creates something that looks more like a raging mob and deforms the way we live. I'm talking about non-economic ways, freedoms and the way we treat each other, and essentially destroys the integrated economy that we have had. And I, I think whether you're on the left or the right, when you're behind the scenes and you're talking to state leaders right now, they're scared. And they're scared of democracy, but they now understand, by and large, that democracy is a reflection of economic dysfunction at this point in time. I think it's a uh the two questions together, I, I think, are, are, very, uh, are very good ones. Um, I think we went through a period of the sort of high point of a sort of hubristic belief that we had all the answers, the post-1990 end of history, fall of the Soviet Union, uh, high point of sort of Washington consensus, in, in which it was believed by many economists that we simply had to have free movement of capital, free movement of, of, of trade, ideally free movement of, of, of people, and you know, all would be the best in the best of all possible worlds. And seen from the top of the mountain at Davos, it, it all looked <laughs> fine. Um, but I think we know that all three of those propositions, you need to think much more carefully about. Uh, free movement of capital combined with total uh, liberalization of finance uh, is part of what led us to 2008 and to uh, the economic shocks which are there. And we know from good economic theory that a lot of the propositions uh, in terms of uh, the benefits of uh, competitive markets just do not apply well when you get to finance. They don't apply as well in relation to finance as they do in relation to other sectors of the economy. I think we know now, uh, the work of David Autor and others in the US has uh, illustrated, that the losers from trade globalization were, were bigger than we thought in the developed economies. I mean, you do uh, uh, first year undergraduate economics, it clearly tells you that uh, free trade is capable of increasing the size of the total economic cake, but it also tells you clearly that it can only do that via movements in relative prices and wages, which must be to the disadvantage of one 
and disadvantage of the other. And there was a huge tendency before the crisis to say, well, yeah, that's true, but it's sort of, it's sort of at the margin, you know, and it'll all come out in the wash over a period of time. But the evidence uh, from the US that there are areas of the US which were particularly exposed to Chinese or Mexican uh, competition and uh, that those where the real wages have fallen most dramatically and those where the opioid abuse problem is greatest and those uh, which voted for Donald Trump in a large amounts. This is a very, very Experience. compelling evidence now um, that you can't have this sort of wonderful, it'll all come out in the wash. And I would say, uh, perhaps controversially, because a lot of people will agree with what I've said and now dislike what I've said, that you have to also ask questions about free movement of, of people as well. Uh, I don't see how you get a large free movement uh, of people into a country and a large and sudden increase in the labour supply without expecting that that will have some impact on the equilibrium real wage rate of the people who are there at the moment. And I think, again, in the UK, before the Brexit vote, the sort of liberal elite was too sort of up here and sort of assuming there's absolutely nothing wrong with immigration. It's all fine. It'll all uh, create uh, benefits in the long term. But there, ha there were some distributional and transitional effects we didn't take account of. So we need an account of economics which is much more subtle and nuanced about this. And we need to legitimate the role of states and governments in managing these processes. Your, your point is, how do we do that um, in an environment where the reaction to some of these stresses is clearly not a sort of highbrow intellectual reaction <laughs> where everybody sits down and analyzes the basic economic theory and works out what we do to manage it. Uh, it's, a, it's a much more angry reaction, and it's an angry reaction that can take us in all sorts of radical directions. And you can get yourself quite depressed about the position that we've got to as a result of that. But I think you know, we in INET believe that if you simply keep working on problems with intellectual honesty and involving a lot of people, at least you can play some role in improving the quality of debate, which makes it more likely um, that we will find a way through these issues and that some politicians uh, and government leaders, or indeed business leaders, have the vision and the leadership uh, to pick up those ideas. But it, it is a major challenge because at the moment the predominant reactions to the downsides of globalization are a set of highly impassioned reactions and including, I think, some completely perverse reactions because I think it's absolutely true, as Joe says, that the election of Donald Trump, I think, is going to do absolutely nothing for the bits of the sort of uh, American white working class which lost out from globalization and which therefore voted for Donald Trump. Indeed, I think the latest agenda of his tax reforms, which is, isn't a tax reform, it's just tax cuts for the rich, is simply going to extend the inequality yet further. Yeah. Yes? Thank you for the question. Um, Easton Nelson from Quartz. You mentioned that uh, gender and racial diversity will be really important to the Commission. Can you just tell us some of the practical steps on which we're going to make sure that the Commission, the ideas, and the people uh, reflect that. Uh, I didn't hear clearly, no, but gender uh, diversity. Yes. And, and, well, and how are we going to make sure that happens? How, how, okay. how are we going to well, stop this being this line of? Well, we're not all white. I mean, you know, we've got a bit of we've got a bit of balance over there on the yeah. ethnic, but we're not doing so well on the gender right up here. Not, you know? not in the moment. At the moment. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so, unfortunately, Winnie Bianima, who was yeah. supposed to be part of this, couldn't be here today because she's meeting with the ILO. But she she'll is be here tomorrow. tomorrow. She'll be here so, tomorrow. Uh, yeah. But uh, part of tomorrow. it has to do with the selection of people, of, of women, of people of color and so forth as commissioners. Part of it has to do with consciously embracing the agenda uh, that incorporates those uh, ver various dimensions which are what you might call historically quite neglected. Uh, I'll, I'll speak just from my own heart. I'm married to a black woman. I have two mixed race children. I don't get up in the morning without having to think about some of these things. It doesn't mean I do it right. But I feel a real urgency. We held a big conference, Dara and I were at, in Detroit last year on inequality and race within the United States. It was probably the most electrified and controversial audience that I've ever been in front of. We're going to continue that next year, as INET now, in Los Angeles, talking about the influence of the Hispanic community and how that relates to the economy, particularly in the aftermath of Trump's election. 
This is much more a global problem. This is a problem that relates to Africa, South Asia, and I think, how would I say, we had a meeting earlier today about how do we define the questions? What are the most morally and ethically important questions to ask about the well-being of humankind? And uh, it's, it's quite obvious. Uh, if you look at the sustainable development goals, I was on a panel earlier this year and argued that gender discrimination, if that's addressed, and it's quite severe based on reports that I read as part of that group in Africa and in South Asia, but if you address gender inequality, particularly because of the ramifications it has for children, it has almost more to do with alleviating poverty than any of the other, or many of the other development goals put together. So I think, uh, obviously, Winnie is very uh, formidable, and we met with Max Bishop from her staff today as part of this meeting, because she couldn't be here and he stepped in. Uh, all I, I guess what I can say is uh, keep challenging me. Keep challenging me Could I to, to make sure that we get that dimension raised to the level of consciousness and devote the resources to it that we should. Could I add a word? If I could connect the last two questions. Um, I'm from Canada, and, and in Canada, people still listen to experts, so I, I feel good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from Canada, where we have a saying that the good player isn't where the hockey puck is, but where it will be. And I think that's going to be important <laughs> in terms of the impact that we as a group have, is people will listen to us if we provide sensible solutions to issues that are there and people kind of sense them, but we're not quite sure. And I think what we got wrong with the globalization thing is people assumed, uh, dare I say, a certain subset of the population, assumed what the issues are, knew what the problem would be, and provided the solution. Well, what we're going to do is recognize that there's nuance and, as you said, education in all of this. And my third point about being from Canada is, as you know, we have a very feminist administration. We have a balanced cabinet. We just announced uh, a feminist um, uh, foreign aid uh, and foreign policy. We're injecting these issues into tough, tough fora like NAFTA renegotiation. And so I'd echo what Rob said, that uh, I don't see myself as the diversity guy on the extreme left or the extreme right of this panel, depending on where you sit. But I do think we all have an obligation to understand that the world is a complex and diverse place. And the only solutions that will work are those that recognize that complexity and diversity matter and that these are strengths and they build resilience, just as in the ecosystem. Resilience comes from diversity, not from unipolar thinking. And that's the commitment that I certainly can make to you. Joe, any thoughts? OK. No, I think, any I think further? One more question, then I think we probably have to tie things up. Hi, uh, Daniel Lapidus from Rethinking Economics. Um, it was mentioned that the uh, rental economy is very different to what is taught in current economic classes. Does this commission have any strategies to help the current students that are learning these false models? Yeah, so one of the things that we did talk about uh, today uh, was how do we disseminate the ideas that uh, we formulate. And one strand of that was <coughs> to think about, this is, uh, to think about how we can get these into curriculum. And INED has been uh, providing some support for curricular development as you know, sort of an alternative uh, models available uh, without the uh, IPR, the high fees associated with current American textbooks. So you can download uh, the, the, <laughs> the textbook online. Uh, so it's trying to provide an alternative model of curricular development and, uh, 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 than, than is currently the, the basic model. So uh, in one way or another, uh, we will uh, make sure the ideas are available on internet and papers and a variety of forms. And uh, our ambition is to make some of this available in a form that will be absorbed into the curriculum. 
because these ideas are, are you know, there are a lot of uh, tropes, there are a lot of misconceptions uh, about how economies function, you know, the dangers of, of uh, uh, debt financed uh, uh, expansion in an economy facing deficient demand. Um, uh, as just one example, you know, austerity has never worked, and and uh, uh, so one of the issues that were, you know, I described a whole set of issues we're going to be addressing. Part of that is what are the answers? You know, we're we're not only concerned about describing these set of interrelated problems, but providing some solutions, and some of those solutions are going to go against some of the conventional wisdom uh, about, uh, you know, arguing that uh, um, there is actually a, a, a strong record of efficient provision of public services, efficient uh, debt financed expansion. Um, so that uh, uh, I hope that the, this will con make a contribution to, to the way economics is taught. Because in the end, I think all of us are committed to democratic processes. And the only way you're going to change voter behavior is through education, both through universities, but also through the press. I uh, feel right now the pain of the embargo on Peter Bofinger, because in many ways today in our meeting, he led the uh, urgency to uh, include curriculum as part of our dissemination strategy. So I don't know whether to encourage you to talk to him in two weeks or talk to him right now, but <laughs> I thought he had a lot of insights in that regard, and, and in the future he can be at the vanguard of uh, expressing our intent there and, and, and developing the work. Uh, yeah. Oh, uh, just the, the question about curriculum maybe. Sure. Oh, sorry, uh, Tim O'Reilly, uh, O'Reilly Media. I'm, I'm actually a tech guy, not in the econ economics area. But I have a question. When you talk about interventions like education, do you also think about interventions in the way we do accounting? I've been thinking a lot about lately, you know, is there a standardized way of reporting and comparing companies on how much do they pay in tax? how much they pay out to employees as well as to capital. We have a, a set of financial statements that seem very biased towards treating people as a cost to be eliminated. And uh, you know, are there ways that we could intervene with financial uh, accounting standards that would be productive as a way of introducing new economic thinking? Yeah, so, so that's a topic in which we did actually talk about today. And, um, uh, I chaired an a international commission on the measurement of economic performance and social progress, which was very much mm -hmm. concerned about the fact that, for instance, GDP encourages us to focus on some things uh, rather than others, and therefore distorts decision making. Uh, and, uh, you know, the the, the uh, uh, and the Scottish government has been actually leading uh, one of the con uh, one of the places where there's been the most thought thinking uh, at the level of government about uh, how you put this these ideas into into practice. Uh, so um, uh, yeah, so that that will be one of the things that we'll uh, uh, talk about because it is one of the ways that people's behavior or government's behavior is affected because. Just to give you one example, uh, we don't uh, include in our GDP measures environmental degradation or, or um, uh, resource depletion. GDP doesn't take into account who's getting the benefits of the increases in output. We don't talk about economic, social, political, uh, or environmental sustainability. All of these things are, which are obviously very important for the functioning of our society and our economy. And uh, there, ha there are measures, there, are, there has been progress in developing better metrics, but 
a lot of the again conventional wisdom <coughs> ignores uh, the these has has not paid as much attention to these ideas as it should have. Yeah. I think the whole essence is, is there a distributional economics that we should be you know, measuring much more uh, effectively than we are? Yeah, and the answer is that we have numbers that we, we that, that uh, uh, can draw attention. I mean, just to give you one number uh, in the United States that really gives a, such a different picture of what is going on, um, median income, which is income of the individual in the middle, half above, half below. Uh, we talk about how GDP goes up every year, but uh, uh, median income of, say, a full-time male worker in the United States is, uh, and full-time is rare, <laughs> it's hard to get a full-time job, uh, is at the same level that it was some 42 years ago, almost a half century ago. So if you want to understand why there's some discontent, there's real basis for that discontent. Uh, Tim, I'd encourage you, while you're at this conference, to attend the session that uh, Nobel laureate George Akerlof will lead. Uh, he's run something called the Earn Network, Economic Research in, uh, so Economic Research in Identity, Norms, and Narrative. And he is very concerned with how we construct and convince society what justice is at any given time and, and the definitions and what is accepted and how people are taught as to what is legitimate is very much an important part of the coherence of our economy. So I, I think that session will uh, delve right into your question. Question for Rob and for Lord Turner, perhaps. Uh, Can you say your name? Jasper Zimmerman from Deutsche Welle. Um, I have um, um, been listening to a lot of wonderful ideas, uh, not just at this INET conference, but at previous ones, uh, about what policy instruments could be applied to uh, solve a lot of the problems that all of us are concerned about. And um, I think this is wonderful that you're getting together to really try to synthesize a package of ideas. But a question that I have uh, struck me ever since I did my master's degree about 168 years ago in resource and environmental management, when even then we talked about, for example, on carbon and how we can deal with the climate problem, what kind of financial instruments, carbon taxes levied directly uh, injected into uh, R&D funds to develop technology solutions, so on. none of this ever happened. So what I'm, my question is, is it good enough to have the right solutions ideas and to write reports, do we need um, an equal amount of effort, perhaps even a greater amount of effort, into marketing those solutions to the decision makers? Do we need a political strategy, political and media strategy, and to ask why these very sensible solutions that the, a lot of, you know, Frau Merkel is easily, easily smart enough to understand, why have they not been implemented? Ask that question. <laughs> and then figure out an answer that's going to actually get us there. Is that part of what you are looking at doing? Are you, do you have a story? Well, look, I, you know, at one level you can get pessimistic about, you know, we come up with these ideas that they don't get implemented. But, you know, there are some things that make me, you know, more optimistic about the world. The Climate Change Committee, of which I was the first chair, in charge of making sure that we drove down uh, an emissions uh, uh, level. The UK is now about 42% uh, below 1990 levels and is going to get to 80% below by 2050. In our early work, we argued that if you did initial um, uh, uh, subsidies and support for um, uh, wind and solar, although they were very expensive back in 2008, that they will, would come down. That was done across the world because a lot of people were arguing that simultaneously all over the place. And 10 years later, the cost of solar PV is about 90% below where it was in 2008. The cost of wind is about 65, 70% below. And the cost of batteries is about 70% below. And the cost of batteries, by the way, was partly driven by very sensible government-driven policy, in particular, hugely important role of the American Department of Energy which run under uh, Obama by two Nobel Prize winning uh, 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 scientists, physicists and chemists, um, set a target 
which is you have to have batteries to make the renewable energy system work, set a target that by 2020 enough things would happen uh, that the cost of batteries in 2008, about $1,000 per kilowatt hour storable, would get down to about $100 per kilowatt hour storable by 2020, and we're just about going to get there. So good things sometimes do happen. Sometimes, you know, there are politicians who listen to experts. Sometimes arguments uh, get, get, you know, uh, uh, succeed. So, but I absolutely agree that one has to take ideas and argue them through the political process. I'm the chair now of a thing called the Energy Transition Commission. Uh, we uh, believe that it is possible to build near total renewable systems at a low uh, cost, uh, lower than fossil fuels. Uh, and we are now working, the, my co-chair is a chap called Ajay Mathur, is the head of the Energy and Resources Institute of India. We are setting up a ETC India, uh, Energy Transition Commission India, with corporate support from Indian corporates, with foundation support, to essentially do a piece of work to persuade the Indian government that they do not need to build a whole load more coal-fired power stations, uh, but they can move beyond that to the renewable energy stage. And within the work program of that, you absolutely have to, and we have defined, part of it is analytical work on is it technologically and economically possible, and partly is a continual process of engagement uh, with the local political uh, leadership uh, to convince them. But in that convincing process, you also have to be um, sensitive to the distributional costs. I mean, India has a lot of coal miners in Bihar and Orissa. And like coal miners often are, they are very, very regionally concentrated. And so whereas I can prove to you that the total number of jobs uh, which will be created in renewable installations is actually greater than the number of jobs uh, in uh, a, uh, the coal mining areas, these ones are very concentrated and these ones are spread out. So you have to have a sensitive political engagement on that. So I simply wanted to say all that because it's very easy to get oneself depressed, and every now and then I have to make myself optimistic so I get up in the morning happy. You have a marketing strategy to get the... Yeah, the absolutely. Yeah. I uh, am always reminded that Joseph Schumpeter was asked, what is economics about? And he said three things, politics, politics, and politics. Mm -hmm. So, yes, technocratic ideas, having a proper vision, having a vision that breaks out of what you might call unconscious hidden assumptions and conventional wisdom is important, but it's not sufficient. And if somebody, I, as a matter of fact, last night I spoke to the concluding panel of the uh, Young Scholars Initiative over at the Corn Exchange, and somebody said, well, if you want to move economics forward, what one idea could you put forward? And my answer was that politics and economics are never separate. So I think you're asking the right question. I think it's a part of our challenge, and, uh, and I think a lot of times good things don't get done because there is resistance. And, uh, and I wish you the very best of luck. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. And uh, we, now that we've announced this, I feel the weight on my back, but I like to climb big mountains. So uh, thanks for joining us. We look forward to talking to you in the future.